All right. Well, again, uh, thank you. Thank everyone for having uh, me out here. It's been a great conference, great attendance. Um, that was a fantastic case. But n now that we're done talking about all the boring stuff like controlling bleeding and operating on the lung, we're going to get to the real exciting stuff, which is how would you feed this patient, right? This critically ill, critically injured ICU patient. Uh, and I'm not going to be doing an extensive survey of nutrition. I'm going to be talking about the more recent data. And I think it's really important because there have been some significant changes in ICU nutrition in the latest set of guidelines that have come out from what we used to do. And so I think it's real important to be aware of those changes. Uh, these are my disclosures. I don't have any financial conflicts. Again, I'm in the military. Obviously, I don't have any finances. My nutrition today was four cups of coffee and a glazed donut. So the theme here is do as I say, not as I do. Um, in some aspects, a lot of us have become what we call nutrition nihilists. This, in this, the PEPUP trials are a great example. So this was multi-center, cluster randomized trials, and what they did is they randomized them to a very intensive nutrition strategy where they really tried to get them up to goal nutrition versus standard care. And what they found is that it worked beautifully. They delivered more nutrition, delivered it more reliably, delivered more enterally, except absolutely no difference in outcomes between the two groups, the standard care versus all these int intensive nutrition interventions. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that, which I'm going to go through here. So if you look at nutrition research and practice, and if you looked at this 15, 20 years ago, you would have said, we have no good evidence base. We don't have any big prospective randomized trials. That's not our problem any longer. We have, we have a ton of them now. Actually, the problem is more this. If you go to look up something on nutrition now, there's almost too much data for any one person to synthesize. This is kind of what I feel like when I'm doing an internet search for some nutrition topic, especially for critically ill patients. So fortunately, you have two fantastic resources that have done all that for you. This is one. This is the Canadian critical care guidelines on this website. Um, and it not only has all of the guidelines, and they were updated in 2015, it has PowerPoint talks, it has nutrition risk calculators, et cetera. Fantastic resource. And then the other resource is, and this is the, more the U.S. side, is the Society of Critical Care Medicine uh, in combination with Aspen guidelines, and those also were just updated in 2016. So between the two of them, you have a very good synthesis of all the data out there. And I'm going to run through some of that data, but first a couple concepts. First thing is, is this is not starvation in the ICU. This is not they've got a massive caloric deficit and you just need to give them more and more calories. So you have to consider both pro and adverse effects of nutrition in these patients. Because in some cases, they are just unable to process a nutritional load correctly. And, and I make the uh, analogy of the combustion engine, right? If you look at the body as a combustion engine, you give it nutrition or gas, and what you get is work and toxins. And hopefully, you get a lot more work than toxins. Well, we know our ICU patients, in many senses, their engine is broken. They don't process nutrients correctly. So what do you get? You actually tend to get much more toxins and some or even sometimes no work out of it. So, and in some sense, the sicker they are, the less ready they are for aggressive supplemental nutrition. So the sicker they are, the less well they may handle a big caloric load, a big protein load, a big lipid load, et cetera. So let's, let's just go through a couple questions. First is how much should we feed? We spent a lot of time talking about this, and I, and I came up in the era of, you know, the, this was handed down, you shall feed 30 to 35 K cows per keg per day for adults, not for pediatric patients, uh, and that every ICU patient is basically the same. And so this formula works for everyone, and we know this is not the case. And, and, and this, is, this is actually old data from 2002, and we know that overfeeding these patients, not only is it not helpful, in many cases it's harmful. This just shows what happens when you overfeed them. So it, as you go down the line, what we would like to see is this increasing lean body mass. The only thing we're getting when we feed them more calories is an increase in fat mass, exactly what we don't want in our ICU patients. So this is, this is one of the latest trials that really hits this home. This is the PERMIT study. Um, and this was a study where they took almost 900 ICU patients who were being fed enterally and they randomized them to a low calorie approach, so only giving them about half of the calories you estimate they need versus a full calorie approach. And this is, this is called permissive underfeeding or hypocaloric feeding. Very important though, they gave them all full protein. So they all got a full dose of protein, just about half the calories in the low calorie group. And then they looked at a bunch of outcome measures. 
And, and this just shows they did a good job of randomization and treatment. So the high calorie group got more calories, the low calorie group got less. The, both groups got the same protein. And this is a busy slide. You don't need to know any of this other than all those p-values are not significant. Every outcome measure, no different. So there was absolutely no benefit of giving these patients full calorie feeds versus a low calorie, about 50% of estimated caloric needs. Again, counter to a lot of what we thought in ICU patients. Well, were there any benefits of giving them less calories? If you look at the less calorie group, they had less need for a dialysis, lower serum glucose, less need for insulin requirements. So it looks like a lot of what we did by giving them full calorie feeds was only making them more hyperglycemic and driving up their insulin requirements. Things we know are not good in ICU patients. And, and this isn't like a rogue study. This actually replicates at least two other randomized trials, the EDEN trial, which, which was in ARDS patients, and then the RICE trial, which was in renal failure patients. And this is, again, from the Canadian guidelines. They, they do a nice synthesis, so they aggregated these randomized trials. And what they found is that not only, again, could they find no benefit of full calorie feedings, they actually showed a trend towards decreased mortality with the hypocaloric approach in ICU patients. And you can see that odds ratio is 85. So about a 15% reduction in mortality, P of 0 0.07, so almost significant, you know, a, a trend that I would consider. And then hot off the presses, this actually, this study just came out probably a couple months ago, and this was looking at all the literature on full feeding versus hypocaloric feeding. Uh, and they looked at a couple different strategies. So trophic, now, and, and it's important to distinguish trophic from hypocaloric. Trophic strategies are you just run 20 cc's an hour of enteral feeds for the first week, so you're given low calorie and low protein. Hypocaloric, you're given low calories but full protein and then total. And essentially what you see there is there's no difference in infections and sepsis with any of those strategies. Then when we look at mortality, again, trophic looks about no different from full feeding. And remember, that's low calorie and low protein. And then uh, and when you look at all the data, it doesn't look like there's much of a difference between hypocaloric versus full caloric. But when you look at the hypocaloric strategy, again, which is about 50% of calories but full protein, Again, there's that trend towards actually decreased mortality with hypocaloric feeding. So, so I think we can pretty consistently say there doesn't appear to be any benefit of full calorie feeding, and there's some pretty strong evidence there might be some benefit of actually giving them less calories. And then this, this was a small trial. I, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into this, but this again was in ARDS patients. And they, they again randomized them to full calorie intensive nutrition versus standard. And actually what they found is higher mortality in the intensive nutrition group. In fact, this study was stopped early because of that excess mortality in the intensive uh, nutrition group. So what do the guidelines say? So these are the Canadian guidelines. Um, they have actually have upgraded their recommendation for hypocaloric feeding in the ICU. Uh, but what they say is hypocaloric is good for low risk patients, but they don't really tell you what you should do for high risk patients. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute about low and high risk. And same thing for the SCCM Aspen guidelines, pretty consistent. They say trophic or hypocaloric is appropriate for these patient groups. Uh, and, and they also do make the caveat, this should be hypocaloric, but giving them full protein. And then they also say, but we're not sure about high risk patients. So first question is, how do I determine risk in my ICU patients for nutrition? And, and I think this is now the, the current standard of care or the best score available. It's called the Nutrix score. And it takes all those factors into account and it gives you a score that can tell you is your patient low, moderate, or high risk. Uh, it includes all those factors, age, Apache, SOFA, IL-6 levels. How many of you are checking IL-6 levels in your ICU patients? Good, no one, okay. Yeah, you can actually replace that with a CRP or omit it, and the score is still just as predictive. Uh, and it has a very good area under the curve for predicting mortality, uh, but buyer beware, just because the score tells you it's a high risk patient, that doesn't mean they need higher nutrition. It means they're higher nutrition risk. Doesn't mean they need more calories. So how about the feeding route? Enteral, TPN, both. I, I came up in the, this was, this was how I was trained. Enteral feeding was good. You should always feed enterally. TPN was evil. TPN was the devil, more infections, excess mortality. And, and the, again, the pendulum always swings on these things. The pendulum is really swinging back on this one. And, and that's really, you need to look at the statistics of that early TPN data, right? We all know about statistics. We can manipulate it any way we want. 
Well, what were those adverse outcomes in all those TPN studies? They were line infections and ventilator pneumonias, right? What's happened to our incidence of line infections? They're disappearing, almost like smallpox, right? It's so rare we have a central line associated infection now. We heard yesterday, what about VAPs? VAPs are almost becoming the point where they're calling them a never event, right? So we've really decreased the incidence of those complications we used to see with TPN. And this is just a review of the current literature, and you can see here, it's, it's the TPN is no longer associated with any increased risk of infectious complications, and this was confirmed in these two big, large, randomized trials that recently came out. So I think that old thinking of TPN is evil and, and you know, if you can't give enteral, don't give anything, that's going away. And, and then this is me whenever I have a new study that comes out that supports my biases. So this is the calories trial, again, another recent trial, New England Journal. 2,400 ICU patients, and they randomize them to early enteral versus early TPN. And we all know how this should turn out, right? Early enteral should be better. I mean, we just know that, right? It's good to feed the gut. Enteral should do much better than the ones who didn't get enteral and got TPN. Actually, what they showed is, so they gave them the same amount of calories, which is important, whether they got randomized to enteral or TPN. No difference in mortality at 30 or 90 days, or infection or 14 other secondary outcomes. And so this is kind of how I feel when that comes out. Yeah, exactly. Come on. I mean, enteral should have been better, right? So all this, this changes your worldview. Again, another very recent meta-analysis that now took all this data, all the recent data on enteral versus TPN. And here's what they found. Mortality, no difference. No difference between TPN or enteral. How about morbidity, though? So when you look at morbidity, if you see that top block, there is, a, there is a difference that favors enteral. But when you look at what those studies are, that's the older studies where patients on TPN got a lot more calories. In the more modern studies where you gave them the same amount of calories, there was actually no difference in morbidity. So no difference in morbidity or mortality when you use TPN like you should, smartly and not overfeeding patients. And this is now reflected in the guidelines, right? The Canadian guidelines. They've downgraded. They, they had a very strong recommendation to always use NRO over TPN. They've downgraded that, and they've upgraded their use of, of TPN versus keeping patients NPO. So I think we can liberalize our smart use of TPN and that it's a reasonable alternative to enteral nutrition. And this is the SCCM guidelines. Again, pretty similar. They say you should always be assessing your nutritional risk. So all patients should get a an, an nutritional risk score or a Nutric, and I think Nutric is the better score. And for the low-risk patients, if they're not tolerating enteral by day seven, start TPN. But actually, if they're high risk, they say start TPN right away. This is a big change. You know, the old guidelines used to be don't ever use TPN until they're one to two weeks into it and you can't feed them. But if they're high risk, they're saying now start TPN right away. So I think of TPN like John Travolta, right? The 70s, he was the hottest new thing. Everybody loved him. Then, so, you know, the 80s and 90s, he's making movies with talking babies. And then, you know, he comes back with a vengeance, and now he's back in vogue again. So that's kind of like TPN. Lipid formulations. The easy way to think about lipids is just like when you get your lipids checked, right? We, we know when you get your cholesterol checked, you have good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. We have good lipids and bad lipids. Good lipids, fish oil, omega-3 lipids. Bad lipids, soybean or medium-chain triglycerides. Guess which one we use in the U.S.? That's right, we use the bad lipids, the soybean and the median chain triglycerides. The fish oils still aren't approved for use in the U.S. They use them in Europe. So which should you use for TPN? Well, it's, it's pretty, the data is pretty clear. The fish oils are much less inflammatory and it goes along a spectrum. The MCTs or no lipids are medium and soybean oil are the worst. And this, this was a study that just looked at your chances of leaving the ICU alive. Much higher with fish oil lipids. The worst was with MCTs or soybean, and actually even, even giving no lipids was better than giving soybean-based lipids. And then this, was, uh, this is the most recent study called the ICU lipid study, came out last year. This was all severely uh, sick patients, high Apache scores. They randomized them to either fish oil or soybean oil lipids, and, and again confirms much lower infections in the fish oil group. And that appears to be the main benefit of the omega-3 fish oils is lower morbidity. The mortality question is still up in the air. So the recommendations, Canadian guidelines, just very recommend avoiding soybean oil lipids if you can. So the question is, for in the U.S., how much soybean lipid oil should I put in my ICU patient's TPN? Because we don't have the fish oil, right? 
So the nutrition expert, uh, Dean Wormer here from Faber College, has an answer. Zero point zero. So zero, unless if you're treating essential fatty acid deficiency, you can give them low doses. We use once a week in our ICU. Uh, but when fish oil lipids become available, which hopefully they should very soon, we should all be switching to fish oil lipids in our TPN. Glutamine, and Dr. Kozar, I think, had to leave. Glutamine was our big heartbreaker. Glutamine, as an additive, was going to be the biggest benefit. It feeds the gut. It's, it's immunomodulatory. Patients are going to do much better. Um, They've done studies, you know. 60% of the time, it works every time. That does make sense. And unfortunately, that's what happened with glutamine. That doesn't make sense. So the redox study, our heartbreaker. This was a big study, 1,200 patients, multi-organ failure. Now, these were mixed patients, medical and surgical. They randomized them to glutamine or placebo in their enteral feeds. And then they also randomized them. It was a two by two. They randomized them to oxygen, plus or minus. So they looked at both glutamine and antioxidants. And what they found here is at 14 days, there was a trend towards actually higher mortality with glutamine. And then at 28 days, a statistically significant increase in mortality. Same thing for over a hospital stay. Same thing for six-month mortality. So actually, higher mortality when we gave them glutamine. Uh, again, this was, this was a shock to the ICU community. And the antioxidant arm, there was no significant effect. Didn't matter if you gave them or didn't give them antioxidants. Another study that looked at this is the MetaPlus study. And th these guys always name their studies great. MetaPlus, Redox. This was just another study, glutamine, high protein glutamine versus just high protein. It started within 48 hours and pretty similar results. No difference in infections, no difference in most of the endpoints, but there was an increased mortality at six months. Now this was in the medical patients, not the surgical patients, but most of the study was medical patients. And they had about a 1.5 uh, times risk of mortality when they got glutamine. Now there is one study just in surgical patients and this actually came out just this year and this is called the, the, the GLIND study. So the conclusion number one is as surgeons we need to name our studies better. I mean Redox, MetaPlus, and what, what do we, we get the GLIND. Uh, can I buy a vowel? 150 patients, it was very small. These were all surgical, all on TPN and they either got randomized to glutamine or placebo. And the, the, the end point of this is there was no difference. So, and mortality was the same. So there wasn't an increase in mortality with glutamine, but there was clearly no benefit, but also a very small study uh, and not all critically ill patients. So the guidelines are very clear on this now. Canadian guidelines have downgraded both enteral and parenteral glutamine and essentially say don't use it. Um, and remember, this is, this is Canada, so when they say downgrade, you know, that's, that's fighting words for Canada. They're not like us. SCCM Aspen guidelines, same thing. Don't use glutamine, enteral, or parenteral for now. And, and I'm just going to close out with uh, uh, something I think is important. And, and, and in a sense, when, when we talk about modulating the immune system in our ICU patients, we are still in the caveman phase of understanding what we're doing and understanding the metabolic fates of all these things we're adding or what tinkering with a certain aspect of the immune system does. And we really need to know those before we start messing with it. Uh, and and it's, uh, again, these are all the studies that have shown no benefit or even harm of all these immunonutrition uh, uh, strategies. And I'm just going to talk about this one study quick to end. And, and this is a study that you might kind of bypass in the Journal of Trauma. It, it's a basic science, a rat study. It doesn't look like it has anything to do with nutrition, but I think it just emphasizes this point. And so this was a, a study by the Denver group. And the premise of this is we know succinate now is bad in our ICU patients. And succinate accumulation is a bad thing. It seems to drive inflammation, drive multi-organ failure. And we used to think the succinate was coming from glucose metabolism. So hyperglycemia was bad. It drove succinate accumulation. Well, they, they did a rat hemorrhagic shock model, and they gave them radio-labeled glutamine to see where the succinate was coming from. And this was what we thought was happening. Glucose was getting metabolized to succinate. What they found was glutamine was getting broken down and metabolized to succinate. Right? So again, n not that impressive, but when you think about, well, what are we doing when we give these patients a big bolus of glutamine? Well, we're pouring, we're pouring fuel on the fire, right? We're driving huge spikes in succinate. We know succinate is bad for ICU patients. And we never would have suspected this, and they didn't suspect this when we designed these trials. So this, again, just hammers home the point of we really need to know what we're doing with these immune modulating agents. 
Um, these are just a couple references I highly recommend. This is, and these are just reviews. Uh, and this is one by uh, Paul Wishmeyer that talks about how we should be delivering nutrition in our ICU patients. And, and, and I think this is a great strategy, is you start here and you give everyone full protein, but if they're severely ill, you kind of slowly ramp up their calories to a goal. You don't go right with high calorie, but if they're high risk, then you pay a little more attention to that and get a full calories a little quicker. So it's more of a personalized medicine approach rather than just a shotgun approach and tailoring your nutrition to your ICU patient and how sick they are. And then this is another study that talks about all the hypocaloric literature uh, by Paul Merrick. It's again, it's a great review of the concepts there. So again, these are, these are the two references I recommend to anybody who's looking for any data on ICU nutrition, the Canadian website and the SCCM guidelines. So to wrap it up, I think hypochloric full protein feeding clearly has equivalent outcomes. We're still not sure about the high risk patients. You should always be using a risk scoring system for your patients. TPN is definitely making a comeback and, and I feel comfortable going to it much earlier than I used to now. We need fish oil lipids instead of our soybean oils. And early enteral feeds at, uh, within 48 hours is, is the preferred approach still. And don't use glutamine. So uh, I'll, I'll end there. And, and this, is, this is an email, a, a picture someone sent me. And this is actually real data. They look at each state and tell you what you are worst in nationally in rankings. And you'll notice where you guys are. You're worst in alcoholism. And, and I was going to use this to go around and shame every state I go to when I talk to someone until I looked at my state and what we were worst at. <coughs> so, uh, so, so this didn't actually work out as planned, much like some of our nutrition studies. Thank you very much.